Hello, fellow tea drinkers. Welcome to Oversteeped. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about character design. Um, this is an often overlooked aspect of character creation. Usually, people uh, focus on things like personality, uh, the journey in the narrative, the dynamic with other, other characters, things like that, and obviously those are all very important. But for non-visual mediums, such as novels, uh, things like that, character design usually gets very little attention whatsoever, if at all. Which, even though, yes, uh, novels are not visual mediums, uh, they still take place within the theater of the mind. And if you're not doing a good job as a creator fleshing out these visual concepts that you write about, then your reader is going to get lost or characters will tend to blur together. That is a danger. And this often happens in other aspects of the story as well. This is something that people often complain about with bad setting uh, or set dressing, right? They'll say that all of the forests blend together, uh, all the rooms seem the same, that sort of thing. And the, uh, the same danger uh, can befall characters as well, where a lot of the um, side characters especially are not memorable or they, they're not distinct enough. And so that's what we're going to be delving into today. I'm not going to be getting into how to necessarily execute this technique to make a good character or a memorable one, that's something you're going to have to work out for yourself because all characters are unique, or at least they should be. Um, so this isn't a discussion about how to do this. I'm going to be outlining a series that I think does this, uh, handles this masterfully. And the series is Inuyasha by Rumiko Takahashi. So if you're unfamiliar with it, I suggest you give it a watch if you haven't seen the anime, or uh, even better yet, go pick up the manga. Why this series? Of course, we are primarily going to be discussing things that novelists or uh, creative writing, um, people who delve into those facets, they can obviously use tactics from any medium. And of course, graphic novels and manga and the like, they're not going to have the same pitfalls as a novel will, because obviously they are visual mediums. So why am I using this as an example? I would say that you would be hard pressed to find a better cast of characters where they are distinct and their visuals fit them completely. They don't feel out of place, nothing feels slapped on, there aren't attributes, uh, characteristics that feel like afterthoughts or just um, as if they were... You see this a lot with a lot of action, superhero, shonen type stories, things that are more focused on the events rather than the characters, but I call this effect the grab bag effect where there's a bunch of different characteristics and it's almost like someone hit the randomizer button on a video game in creating characters or they just pulled a bunch of attributes out of a bag and slapped them onto one character. Get a lot of like random belts and goggles and uh, interesting hairstyles, but it doesn't necessarily, it, it almost seems like any collection of traits could have worked just as well on that character. And I don't find that appealing at all, and it doesn't necessarily make the character better. It doesn't make them more memorable, it certainly doesn't make them more interesting. Uh, why would I say that Inuyasha works better than anything else? I think that you can get a clear idea about what kind of character you're looking at immediately. You can, you're fed all of the information up front, even though you're not being told. Um, and it might be subconscious, it's not something you're necessarily focused on, you're obviously dealing with a story alongside these elements, but it doesn't feel out of place, and when you get to know them, it clicks instantly. Everything lends to the truth of the character, and it builds on that. It doesn't seem like it's jarring or grating against your expectations. So, that's what we're talking about today, and I'll break it down for you uh, on an individual character level to show examples. So the first example that I'll bring up within this universe is Inuyasha himself. In case you don't know, he is a Hanyo, which just means half-demon. 
Why that's important is that he belongs neither as a person living amongst humans in human society, nor as a full-fledged demon carving his path in the world. So he is a true outcast um, forced to live a half-life. That's important to his character and I will be getting to that, but first let's talk about what he looks like aesthetically. Right away, when we first see him, he is introduced pinned to a tree, uh, completely asleep or um, the appearance of somebody who is long dead or dormant. He is wearing a full red kimono uh, and his hair is starkly white. And just visible from a distance is his uh, white dog ears. Everything about him says, I'm not like you. I'm not normal. I am not a person. I am other. And we are happening upon him at the same time as Kagome, the other protagonist, the main character, the um, narrative character of the story, is entering this new and strange world. And when we come across him, we are reminded immediately that we are not in modern times anymore. He is the first strange thing that we see uh, stepping beyond the well that Kagome leaves into this new world. So he's simultaneously the connection to this otherness, this strange world, and also the, the first person, the first being that Kagome comes across. Now red, of course, is symbolically a passionate color relating to aggression, blood, power, and yet, traditionally, it's also a color that's associated with protection. Shinto shrines uh, in Japan use this color predominantly, along with white. Um, red is thought to enhance the power of the kami, or the, uh, the spirits, the good spirits, um, that dwell there. As well as the, it tends to be associated with warding off disaster and evil. So it's interesting because Inuyasha himself, his color scheme is red and white. And he is, this coloration, this eye-catching this eye -catching, um, coloration, it's quite distinct and he is immediately recognizable even from a distance. He stands out amongst all the greens of the forest and uh, the surrounding um, scenery. Yet the red is familiar and deeply rooted to his humanity. He is both yokai and human in appearance and in reality. This duality of his character is immediately given to the audience or the reader. It was not done by accident. So how can a person embody both uh, savagery, aggression, uh, violence, but also um, symbolically represent protection? Uh, and safety. This is the nature of Inuyasha as a character, that um, he has to fight his, his nature, his baser instincts, and embrace things that he might not be at first willing to embrace. Feeling things for others, having attachments uh, to people, feeling connected to humans, that is something that he shares with his brother Sashomaru is that part of him feels like that's a weakness or that it's a, um, a burden. Something he doesn't want to, uh, to bear. But he isn't able as a character to be truly strong or wield his signature weapon Tetsaiga, which was handed down to him by his father, until he embraces that part of him, that protective compassionate, uh, caring part, the, the part of him that wants to shield others from, from harm, the part of him that wants to, to uh, save people. And uh, it's in this connection that he has to Kagome um, and his willingness to help her, to save her, that he, full, he first uh, gains access to his inner strength. And that's why though it seems contradictory to have that color represent him as both uh, in the way of violence and yet protection, it, I think that it's so perfectly uh, representative of the two sides of him as a character. Mm -hmm.
Now, our second example is going to be Kagome, the other main protagonist of our story and the narrative character. She's the character that is the vehicle for change in the universe, and she is, of course, the anchor to reality. She is necessarily modern looking as she's wearing a school uniform, but her school uniform um, isn't going to be the traditional blue and white uh, sailor suit. It's going to be green and white. And that is because green is symbolically associated with renewal, growth, change, vitality. In Japan, green is also the color of eternity, which is uh, perfect for Kagome, who is Kikyo's reincarnation. More on Kikyo later. So she represents life, and this is exactly what she does for Inuyasha in the story. She pulls an arrow out of his chest, and the gears of their story begin to once again turn. She is the life of the narrative, the change maker. She is aesthetically Inuyasha's near opposite. Where he is primarily clothed in red, she is in green. He is traditionally dressed, and she is modern. His hair is unnaturally white, whereas hers is black. This duality is broken only by the red of her neckerchief, which rests at her chest, which is also uh, intentional as it's Inuyasha's primary color. This bit of red right over Kagome's heart tells us everything we need to know about her. She is grounded down to earth and those are the greens, but she is led by her feelings, that little bit of red right there in the center of her chest. Um, and those feelings are tied intrinsically to Inuyasha. They continue to pull her back. That is their connection, similar to the red string of fate. So, speaking of fate, let's talk about our cursed monk, Moroku. So, he is of course a Buddhist monk, and as such uh, has the appearance at a glance of a respectable person, a man of the cloth. But anyone who's seen the series or has read it uh, knows that's not quite the entire story. I think his color scheme is perfect for him, which is mostly indigo, indigo being a middle ground between blue and purple. This color tends to be mysterious. It's full of intrigue, spirituality. Blue, of course, is a color that is tied to intellectualism, so uh, stoicism, peace, duty, that sort of thing. Purple, elegance, romance, sexuality. And of course, indigo being right in the middle is perfect for Moroku. It's a color that asks more questions than it answers. It's not straightforward, and neither is he. When you think about him as a character, he is... Uh, on the surface or even at a superficial glance um, one way but then e if you get even just a little closer to him you realize that's not the case so he's not abstaining you know he he is a flirtatious person he's he doesn't conduct himself in a respectable manner he's quite roguish he is flirtatious and you get hints of this with his personality uh, even before you, you really have any contact with him as a character, before he even speaks or acts. Um, his hairstyle, for instance, if it were on a different person, might look uh, more in place. He's got his hair pulled back in a ponytail, which could be practical and might seem uh, like something that a, a person of his station would do, but it's not pulled back in a high ponytail, and it's not a um, it's not a more traditional style. It's it's a uh, it's more pirate esque or bandit esque. It's a short ponytail tied back at the nape of his neck, and again, this really plays up the roguish qualities of his character. He keeps uh, his ears pierced, um, which is very unconventional, and again tells us that he lives his life on his terms, and he does things his way, despite uh, expectations. So, we get this, this dual story with Moroku of a man who uh, lives a certain lifestyle, but has a lot of subverted expectations. And of course, this comes across almost immediately upon interacting with him in the story. Now, I like to talk about uh, the layers of his character a little bit further as well. 
because there was such care given to the little details that I think it would be remiss to not talk about them. So he, of course, was cursed with the wind tunnel uh, by Naraku's. Uh, by Naraku, of course, this is uh, as a result of Naraku um, cursing his grandfather, which is he's now inherited through his father. And of course, as a result, he has to keep his hand and arm wrapped up um, with prayer beads covering the wrappings to keep it sealed. Why this is interesting is that um, not only is he a character that has the outer trappings of a monk, which is a respected, revered position in society, but of course underneath there's this secret personality. He has prayer beads, which are of course a symbol of his religion, uh, covering up his dark secret, his curse. And I think that's interesting. It's very symb symbolically tied to what he is as a person. And again, when things are concealed, when things are covered, that usually is an indication of a character not being honest, a character not being trustworthy. Uh, gloved characters, for instance, are often uh, seen as underhanded, possibly um, not trustworthy. And yes, he doesn't wear gloves, but he does have one hand uh, completely concealed. But his other hand, of course, is free and open. And it's that dual nature of Moroku, where underneath everything, he's a good person, despite him con uh, constantly saying that I am, that he's not. So on the surface, he is casual and flirtatious and lacks the kind of responsibility that we would associate with monks, but he is actually very loyal and he is hardworking and he is self-sacrificing. And it is interesting that when he is faced with his mortality or with the darker aspects of his character, he, he doesn't he doesn't want that to be his fate. He doesn't want that to be the fate of his loved ones. And so part of his roguish personality and his casual manner of being that's a result of him wanting to not be attached to people and to not put down roots and to push people away in case they sh should get attached to him because he does in the near future, he knows he's going to suffer a gruesome fate. And so on one hand, he could be perceived as not trustworthy, but when you actually look at the real him, his other hand, that's the real him. And I find that so well done that I, I couldn't help but share that. Jumping off of Moroku, we can then talk about Songo. She is a complicated character, uh, to be sure, but she has a duality about her, not only with her uh, color scheme and the way that her uh, two outfits are designed, but of course in her personality as well. So she wants to be seen as a woman by the man she loves, but she also wants to be valued as a strong warrior by her enemies and her comrades. And Sango's appearance reflects that. Um, she's one of few characters in the series to wear makeup, though it's subtle, and her hair is both feminine and practical at the same time. Beneath her everyday clothing, uh, parts of her uh, outfit, her Demon Slayer outfit, are visible. She is consequently ever ready for battle and we the viewer or the reader we, we immediately know this and as a demon slayer her appearance is ninja-esque this immediately contrasts with the usual silhouette of a ninja because hirai coats her giant boomerang made of demon bones tells us the reader or the audience that songo is a strong warrior but it also does the job of subverting expectations of what a ninja really is. We can break that down a little bit further. Ninja are often presented as sneaky, underhanded, mysterious, things like that. Certainly not the image of brute strength. Definitely not that of a woman riding a flaming demon saber cat while hurling a giant boomerang at her enemies. This one addition to her silhouette, Hiraikot's, tells you everything you need to know about Sango. That she's blunt, she can't guard her feelings, and above all, is the least mysterious ninja you'll ever meet. And that's brilliant. She fights in the open. Everything about her says, silent yet obvious threat. 
She is the embodiment of if looks could kill. When she's angry, everyone in her group can tell. She isn't capable of hiding her true feelings, and that's okay. This goes the same for her uh, demon cat, Kilala, companion. Um, her preferred state outside of battle is small and unassuming, but that doesn't disguise her strange appearance. And without being told, we, uh, the reader in the audience, know there's something special about her. She's not hiding it. Songo and Kilala are perfect. They complement each other so well. Now, I also want to talk about Songo's color scheme, which is primarily black and a deep pink color um, when she's in her Demon Slayer outfit. Now, black is of course uh, dutiful and protective and somber, traditional obviously as well, and effective, things like that, which she is. But pink of course is passionate and emotive and there's a feminine strength to it, as well as the fact that it is a color associated with feeling and love. So what we can tell just based on this color uh, scheme is that she is driven and dutiful and her character is about love, which it is. Her love for her brother Kohaku, which is her driving force in the, in the series, uh, compels her to fight for him and to uh, do what she can to conquer Naraku and bring justice to her family. The love she also feels, not only connected to Kohaku but also to Moroku as well, is something that connects her to the to the others in the group. She is uh, she's strong because of her love, and that's what we get to to know immediately from looking at her. It complements her personality so well. Moving off of Sango, we can talk about the final member of their uh, core team, Shippo. Now, Shippo is a little fox demon, and being a child means that his current appearance doesn't necessarily predict his mature ensemble, uh, though his colors, turquoise and copper, lend perfectly to his current playful, mischievous personality. Uh, he is, after all, a fox. And he wears quite the expensive getup for so small and young a character, as well as the fact that he keeps his hair tied in a high ponytail. This tells us without much information that he is of noble birth. And like other yokai in the series, Sashomaru, Koga, etc., Shippo wears what we can see or interpret as a pelt, and his is shaped like a vest or an overcoat. Shippo's diminished size, foxtail, and paws all add to his overall mischievous appearance. He's very playfully, visually. And he's also a collection of what I like to, to say are like round shapes. His tail is very fluffy and round, his head is a very round shape, and his torso and the rest of his body sort of um, also very round. Um, it's no surprise that his method of transformation is also a literal ball. So everything about him says, I'm playful, I'm mischievous, I'm curious. I'm the embodiment of uh, a child. And I think that we get fed that information very intentionally and right off the bat, everything about him is very well composed. All right, jumping from Shippo, we can talk about another prominent uh, character in the story who is also a full-blooded demon. Let's discuss Sushomaru, Inuyasha's half-brother. So, Sushomaru is markedly very similar, and yet very different visually from Inuyasha. White is a shared color, but unlike Inuyasha, Sushomaru's silvers and violets lend him an air of ethereal beauty and elegance to contrast Inuyasha's savagery. Violet is traditionally associated with nobility in both Western and Eastern culture, and his status as a great lord is accepted immediately by the audience or reader. He looks nothing less than what he is. He is intentionally impressive and complicated. He is heavily accessorized to the point that his armor and swords appear mere pieces of decoration. You get the sense immediately that he doesn't actually need his adornments, um, that these are symbols of status and grace rather than protection from harm. And this initial impression is proven correct. He fights with barely a sideways glance at his sword, preferring to dispatch nuisances and threats with a quick slash of his claw. His posture is upright, his gait relaxed, his eyes are ever locked on the horizon. Like his name, his appearance lends itself to lifelessness, 
for he is truly of this world, but not a part of it. He persists, but does not live. His appearance is unmistakably otherworldly, pure and untouched by the visceral imperfections of the mortal human world. This comes across in all aspects of his design. He is expressionless, barely showing emotion. It isn't until he gains a human companion that a shift begins to take place in Sushomaru, allowing him to feel the breadth of emotions that were previously out of reach. So it would be impossible to talk about Sushomaru as a character without uh, bringing up Rin. So Rin, uh, his human companion, embodies warmth itself as the color scheme is yellow and orange. Much like a sunflower or even the sun itself, she practically glows with vitality and optimism. This perfectly contrasts to Shomaru's cold palette of silvers and violets. Her stance and posture is always very open. You'll notice that when she's walking or when she's running, uh, her arms are always out to the sides or outstretched. She fully encapsulates uh, the concept of being welcoming, optimistic, trusting. This comes across immediately. Um, she breathes a lot of life into his group, which is entirely made up of uh, demons. Aun, the uh, dragon steed, uh, Jokin, the imp demon, and of course the Shomaru himself, our demon lord. Now, it's not just that she is human and has human emotions, it's also that she is the necessary combination of traits that was needed at the time for Sushomru to make that change and start taking notice of the human world, start really feeling affected by other people. And it is in the ways that they're different that these two can grow in a positive way with each other. Where he is refined and reserved and elegant, she is wild um, and carefree and unapologetically mortal. Of course, he is clothed and shooed and she is barefoot. She runs around filthy all the time. They are directly contrasting one another and yet it is perfectly in harmony. The pair of them do work to perfectly complement one another. Now, I could go on about the various characters throughout the series. Uh, there are plenty of important ones that I haven't yet touched on. Kikyo, Kohaku, Koga, a lot of Ks. <laughs> um, but so many characters in Inuyasha are not only well thought out personality wise or their role within the story, but visually as well. I just don't have the time to address each and every one of them. But very quickly I can even touch upon the things that I, I noticed right away about them. Koga, much like uh, Sashomaru or even Naraku, is a kind of foil to, to Inuyasha. Koga, unlike Inuyasha, is a full-fledged demon and he has all of the um, privileges that go along with it that Inuyasha craves, right? And because of that, he has uh, people he can rely on, he has family. Um, he has power and freedom and all of these uh, different things that Inuyasha obviously grew up without. But because of the fact that he faced very little hardship up until the point of the story, he, he's arrogant where Inuyasha is not. And he's careless and reckless and a lot of other things that contrast Inuyasha's other personality traits where they are a mirror of each other and yet very distinct. And of course it comes across in his appearance. He's got more earthy tones of browns and greys and beiges and things like that and uh, whereas Inuyasha is of course that stark red color. And uh, Koga um, of course has the steely blue-gray eyes and Inuyasha has the yellowy gold and Koga's got the black hair, whereas Inuyasha has the white. This was done on, uh, obviously intentionally. They are meant to be rivals. Kikyo, of course, uh, she is a Yamato Nadeshiko, which is basically the uh, flower of Japanese womanhood. Um, she's obviously uh, also a Miko, which is a uh, shrine priestess. And so visually speaking, she's going to 
of course follow that that aesthetic the same one that Kaede holds to as well but the way she carries herself her facial expression the style of her hair it's it all perfectly harmonizes to form the the character that she is and uh touching on Kohaku Sango's uh younger brother he he has this open expression and uh, freckled face and of course he's got the uh, the short uh, high ponytail and he wears very simple uh, clothing when not in his demon slayer uniform and he is this cherished uh, younger brother archetype uh, the way that he looks um, it's endearing and he's very naive uh, in both appearance and personality and it's just a quick example which I won't get into, but uh, all of these characters and m many, many more are just perfectly crafted, in my opinion, visually. It just completely sells their personality. Uh, nothing seems out of place. And I think that it would, it, it would be difficult to go into every single one, obviously. There's just way too many, but um, I do recommend uh, giving the show a watch or the manga a read because she, Rumiko Takahashi, she expertly uh, and painstakingly puts these characters together in such a way where nothing is out of place, um, nothing is unintentional. You can see her hand in it with every single character that she's created. So now that I've quickly touched on the side characters and uh, whatnot. We will discuss um, the last major character of the series, the main antagonist, Noraku. Now, why I left him till the end, aside from him being uh, not a protagonist, um, is, is that this is an example of how to purposefully make a character's design obscured and I'm going to explain that. So Naraku's color palette is extremely unclear even from the beginning. His silhouette is basically just a snapshots that your mind puts together in order to form an idea. Um, he's a complicated character who is deliberately shown in stages, pieces rather, than completely for what he is. This is intentional and purposefully, um, it, it, it obscures a clear understanding of him as a character. Because of this choice, his presence is always shifting and the audience and reader is never able to form a picture of what he is in their mind. This disjointed presentation works in harmony with his depiction of a being that is uh, a literal unity of parts. This inability to grasp him as a character mirrors the protagonist's inability to catch and confront him. He cannot be conceptualized, and when you think you are close to understanding him, there is always something new to consider. He is fluid, shadow, smoke. And it's not surprising that he is often shown in shadowy parts of rooms, at a distance, blocked by strategic angles, or variously obscured. He first appears wearing the skin and mask of a baboon. His common appearance is that of a body that he stole from a young lord. The real him is unknown. In flashbacks to his origins, we only get a glimpse of his human self, Onigumo, through gaps in his bandages. He is never whole, and this is exactly the point. Throughout the series, the main characters interact with incarnations of Naraku more than they interact with Naraku himself pieces of their foe. To try to pin down a description would be missing the point of what Naraku as a character is. So in conclusion, character descriptions can aid you in giving the reader or the audience a clearer idea of your character, even without having to say anything, even without relying on dialogue or their action. It just helps really round out this feeling that you're presenting of the character. Or in the case of subverting that, in the case of intentionally uh, confusing or obscuring a character, 
you can do the opposite. You can withhold information. You can uh, only give pieces of information. And this will have the opposite effect intentionally. So character descriptions often overlooked by writers, often overlooked even by uh, seasoned um, authors. They are tools that should be used within your toolbox and not ignored for uh, other aspects of storytelling because honestly, this is what separates a good writer from a great one, in my opinion. I think that there is no better example than the characters of Inuyasha. I think that Rumiko Takahashi has proven herself to be a master of character design. I hope this discussion has been both enlightening and entertaining. If you'd like to see more content like this, be sure to like and subscribe. For now, I'm going to get myself another cup of tea. So like always, let's keep the bag in a little longer for better tea and even better conversations. Thank you and good night.